Right, hello and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, this monthly webinar, Non-Farm Payrolls, day earlier than normal, Thursday the uh, 2nd of July because of the 4th of July holiday, or the holiday tomorrow, or for US Independence Day. I have to put up the um, obligatory disclaimer um, for compliance purposes, so we'll quickly run through the various risk warnings for um, the various different uh, jurisdictions and regions, and uh, then we can then we can uh, then we can get started. So let's just get rid of that, get rid of that, and we can pretty much get started. So basically, non-farm payrolls. Um, every time we do one of these, the focus is always on what a Federal Reserve might do at its next meeting. Obviously, the last time we did one of these um, last month, we had a very good non-farm payrolls number, and it was just ahead of the June meeting um, on the 17th and the 18th of June. Unsurprisingly, um, the Fed um, actually adjusted their growth forecasts down. Um, I say unsurprisingly because the IMF and um, the OECD Basically, had basically pushed their growth forecast down in, in the intervening weeks leading up to that Fed meeting. So, so really, for, for me, it's a basically about given a, a good or bad payrolls number, what are the Fed likely to do in September? So, um, I think the focus, I think, has largely moved away from the jobs numbers. And I think, you know, and, and unless you disagree with me, Colin, I would argue that it's now more on prices. It's on prices and it's on wages, mm -hmm. and I think I agree on that. Also, Mike. Oh, oh yeah. I was going to say also. I think that we do have to keep an eye on what's going on uh, internationally as well, with with Greece and also with uh, with Puerto Rico. That if there's a uh, an external event like a big debt crisis, is also something that could upset the Fed's apple cart over the next few weeks. Mm. And I agree, sure. it's more than the jobs report at this point because mm. all the talkers from the Fed, from the speakers from the Fed, whether it was a, a Fisher and some and uh, and Powell and some of the others have been have been talking towards an, an interest rates of one to one or two before the end of the year. So the question, what would it take them to knock it off? That I think it'd either be like, jobs. I think is less because they seem to be coming along reasonably well. It's like some kind of external event. I think is what we're, is the big one. And you're also right about the inflation. Yeah, because I think Janet Yellen touched upon it. I think in in a statement mm -hmm. in a press conference afterwards, she, her, a key I think a key line in that was that she was concerned that wage growth was subdued, and subdued was the adjective that she used. So, I think that really does underscore how important the the wage growth, the average hourly earnings numbers are going to be. And I think there'll be more focus on that than there will be on the actual unemployment rate or the actual headline number. Also worth keeping an eye on any revisions to previous months as well. Um, certainly in that context, let me remind you of what we've seen in terms of payrolls numbers over the course of the last few months. So you can see here in this left-hand B column here, these are the, the ADP numbers. And as you can see, yesterday we got the best number this year um, for ADP at 237. It's been fairly fairly average, I think, in terms of ADP. Non-farms, 280 in May. Um, the expectation, I think, is round about 230 for June. I'm low-balling slightly. I'm going 207, and I know you're high-balling. You're going around about 250, aren't you? Yes, I am. That's correct. And it's uh, 233 is the, uh, the back street estimate. 233, okay. All right. Oh, oh yeah, no, that's on, on the Bloomberg terminal. You're absolutely right. So you can see from uh, the numbers that we've seen in the non farm payrolls, they've been averaging quite a bit higher um, overall, apart from in March, where we saw a little bit of a significant miss. But that March number there, 119,000, it was revised up from 85. Um, at last month's numbers. So, we, as I say, the revisions are very important. Will May get revised up or will it get revised down? More importantly, what will the June numbers tell us? Bearing in mind that some of the data has actually been particularly patchy. Chicago PMI, for example, um, has been in contraction four of, the, four of the last five months. So, 
you know, it's not all um, it's no sweetness and light with respect to U.S. economic data. There are weak patches within the economy, and prices paid in the ISM yesterday, which is a measure of prices charged by manufacturers, um, remained fairly weak. We expected a bit of an uptick there. It came in at 49.5. So we can see that inflationary pressures continue to remain subdued. And the Fed, and I know, so I apologize to you if you've heard this before, um, the Fed does have a dual mandate. It's very different a central bank to, say, the Bank of England or the, Euro or the European Central Bank, um, who basically just have inflation targeting. They, it has a dual mandate for employment and inflation. And inflation is missing by a mile. So don't get hung up on the fact that the jobs numbers are good. It's not just about the jobs numbers. It's all about the strength of the dollar. So let's get started on the U.S. dollar story. So we'll start with euro dollar. Um, I was hoping to have to not have to talk about the Greek crisis, but unfortunately, um, uh, I don't think there's any escape from it. But certainly looking at this chart here, we can certainly see that the euro dollar is in an uptrend. Obviously, this is the this was the uh, the Sunday night Monday. Um, trading volumes and I think the thing that I was n noted about this was the fact that we opened on the lows of the day and basically closed up so which suggests to me that you know for all euro dollars apparent weaknesses um, the markets are finding it very very difficult to actually push it lower and for me that is a bit of a worry either that or the market's so short that it's taking profits as soon as it sees it let's look at the flip side of that let's look at the dollar index um, the reason I look at the dollar index is simply because it's usually a mirror of euro dollar. Why is it a mirror? Because 57, 55, 55 to 57 percent of the dollar index is the euro. So what I need to see here is a double break. I need to see a break higher on the US dollar index and a break lower on the euro dollar to suggest that this, this number this afternoon is a sustainable number to push the US dollar higher. The dollar has actually risen today, so I think there's an expectation that the market is front running, front running this number, which suggests that there is potential for disappointment, if I may say. Um, so and on top of that, Michael, if you uh, if you're already running ahead and you're not busting that trend line, then uh, if you if you do come in weak, this could take a, a pretty sharp trend lower. In a in a hurry, and the and the question is, what what is it going to take now to break that trend line, and not just that first down trend line. Then you go to the previous high, and you go across, and you've got a channel there too. So you're into a, into a zone of congestion as it is. Well, you've also got these and two retracing the levels right? that here. Trend line, and then that low, same yeah. thing, and the Fibonacci there. Yeah, you've got 50% retracement of 109.60, which happened to mm -hmm. be Monday's lows, and you've also got the 61.8 retracement around about 108.45, which happen to also be the May lows. So the May lows and the June lows have both respected Fibonacci retracement levels. Now, I know it's very counterintuitive to think about not shorting euro dollar, but we're also above the 100-day moving average. And it's not just about the euro dollar. It's also about the dollar index. It's also about the dollar yen, and it's also about the pound against the dollar. So the key levels for me on euro dollar are 110, the lows today around about 110.30, then below that 109.60, and then below that 108.20.30. But let's look, at the, let's look at the pound against the dollar because that's continuing to track lower. It's certainly looking weak, but I'm not that bearish on it, and for a very good reason. Let's look at these moving averages here. We First and foremost, we've got a trend line from the lows, which currently comes in round about... 150, around about 155. We've also got the 100-day moving average, we've got the 50-day moving average, and we've got the 200-day moving average. And the 100, the 50, has actually crossed above the 200. That is, that is potentially bullish, golden cross, but the, the average is pointing down. So it's not, the 200-day moving average is pointing down. So it's not as significant a signal as it could be but the fact that it also coincides with this strong trend line here would appear to suggest that we could be nearing a key support area on the pound against the dollar. So certainly I think even if we do see further declines in the pound, then I think 155, 155.05 is likely to be a very good area of support, certainly on any move lower. 
looking looking at the four hour chart which I'm going to change this to now we can certainly see um, lower lower highs so I think any rally is likely to find selling interest around about 157.20 and I think that's a key area to keep an eye on so at the moment we've we've we're finding a little bit of support around about 155.60. I think the further area of support is a little bit lower, around about 155. Looking on the top side, looking around about 157.20. So positive dollar number will push the pound and the euro lower. A neg slightly negative or disappointing dollar number, you could well see a short squeeze in the pound and in the euro. Similar sort of story on the dollar yen, the old favorite Bill and Ben. Now this is a four hour chart that I'm looking at here ladies and gentlemen. Look at the slow stochastic, it's looking very overbought. More importantly than that, now that we've filled this gap from uh, Monday morning, we've got trend line resistance from the, from the highs, of, you know, the 15 year highs at 120, just above 125.80, coming in just, to, just pretty much above where we are right now. I'm um, also pushing, uh, pushing against the top of the, the, the cloud envelope as well. So looking at this here, if dollar yen is to go higher, what we really need to see is a break above 124, this series of highs through here, but also a bust up through here, um, which suggests to me that maybe, again, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the numbers and the, and the markets are pricing in a good number. We can see, certainly in the case of this dollar yen chart here, we're continuing to track um, significantly higher over the course of um, the last few four-hour trading sessions there. I'm going to finish up with dollar CAD on the currencies because I know Colin wants to talk about that. Quite significant that the dollar strengthened against the Canada. The Canada's weakened to a certain extent. I think those GDP numbers earlier this week certainly haven't helped in terms of the Canada's. No, they Oh, yeah, no, they definitely, they were very soft and they've got uh, people starting to think that the uh, first off on the monthlies that, that the Canada could be getting uh, hit with a recession off the oil price crash, even if it's a mild one. And, and secondly, that it could, uh, we could still, we're still looking at the possibility that the, since Norgus Bank cut a month ago, that the Bank of Canada might have to cut rates this summer. Last, uh, back in January, the Bank of Canada cut a month after Norgus Bank did. So it's, uh, people are going to be looking to the next meeting now to see if, if we do get another cut, and that's why we've seen the Canadian dollar explode up, upward in the last few days. So I think if you see any weakness in the dollar CAD, you're going to find a significant area of support around about 125.60, mm -hmm. simply because it was these two twin peaks here at the beginning of June. We've broken higher, we've ratcheted higher here, and the likelihood is that while we stay above 125.60, we're probably going to hit 127 over the course of the next you know, over the next few trading sessions, certainly in the context of this particular chart here, the momentum does to be does appear to be in favour of the dollar against the CAD, but that that will bring us in towards this sort of area here, um, that peak there, as the next area of resistance around about 126.70 there or thereabouts. So, in terms of getting a flavour for quickly the interest rate story, let's look at the 10-year note because I think that's a generally a fairly good barometer of what prices and yields could do. And certainly prices have been falling, yields have been edging up. What I'm going to do with this one is put a little trend line in through here. We had a slightly bullish candle there, but we do appear to be running into a little bit of support on the prices, which would suggest a little bit of a cap in terms of the yield. So certainly worth keeping an eye on the floor there. If we bust down through there, then obviously yields are going to track higher. Lower, lower bond prices equate to a firmer dollar um, in terms of the way they react inversely to yields. Let's quickly do the indices while we've got a couple of minutes left because I know those of you who trade indices will want to have a look at this. Can have a look at the DAX first and foremost. We've been trading this corridor for quite some time now in the DAX. Um, at the top of the corridor is quite some time away. We're slap bang in the middle of it. We're in no man's land. So, you know, for me, I'm not, I'm not touching this, but we do have a gap here between 11,380 and currently where we are now. So we could well run higher, but we could run into resistance in that gap there. Um, looking at the S&P, um, we did get a move lower 
but we bounced off the 200-day moving average. And the 200-day moving average is going to be key, I think, for an awful lot of indices at the moment. The S&P, the DAX, the, um, the Eurostox 50, they're all finding support there or thereabouts around the 200-day moving average. So certainly in the context of the dailies, ladies and gents, really need to keep an eye on that. Certainly in the context of this little price pattern here, this is quite bullish. We've, we've come down quite a bit lower, so I would, I would expect if we do get a weak number, we could well get a push higher. We do have a gap through here, so 2095, 2100, we could well find resistance if we get a push higher in stock markets. If you want to come in, Colin, just say so. I'm going to finish up with gold because gold does appear to have actually started to track a little bit lower. Again, that's on the back of the firmer dollar story. Um, and as you can see that here on this chart, we've broken the June lows, and now the next area of support is going to be around about the March lows, around about 11.51, there or thereabouts, slightly, slightly below that. I think it's around about 11.30. Let me just do this very, very quickly. 11.43. So 11.43, 11.45, gold prices could well find support if we get a positive dollar number. Okay, so we've now got counting down to 30 seconds. So. Keep an eye on this top one here, average, average earnings, 0.2%. Um, Non-farm payrolls, 230, and unemployment, 5.4%. Let's bring up a dollar yen chart, very short term, and uh, then we can plot the then we can plot the dollar move very quickly. They're already starting to front run a positive dollar number, judging by that dollar yen chart. And I will now keep quiet and let you absorb the numbers. 220. 5.3, the unemployment rate. 5.3, the unemployment Look at the average earnings numbers. Look, that's very, very weak. So that's negative dollar. Negative dollar. That was the number that they were looking for. Participation rate. Okay. Participation rate. Participation rate's the lowest it's been since 1977, 62.6. So unemployment has fallen to 5.3. But all of that has been as a result of a lower participation rate. So that, for me, is a fake number, a very, very much a fake number, because basically the reason the unemployment rate is so low is because you've got a lower percentage of the population actually working. It doesn't actually include, because you drop out of the unemployment numbers once you've been out of work more than a year. So the unemployment rate is actually not a fair reflection of what the actual physical unemployment rate is in the US. 62.6, I mean, that is a shocking number. Um, and to, to my mind, that is, not posit that is not a positive dollar number. And um, I think, once again, you know, the headline number, it's not about the headline number. It's about average earnings. It's about participation. And once again, we're pretty much back to square one. We're now going to be working on data by data basis, data point to data point. I don't think on the basis of those numbers there that the Fed will be moving in September. Your view, so I think this pretty much kills September. I, I do too. I think this uh, this now pretty much kills a uh, a September rate hike, with because uh, that's really low. The downward revision was huge, which means that that last numbers last month's enthusiasm just wasn't there, and uh, and it's both uh, and so yeah. I mean, this is certainly very weak. Uh, declines on the uh, on the hourly earnings as well. I mean, it's just all pointing uh, pointing soft here. So really, uh, we, and that's what we, we're going to be looking at today. You can see it here in the dollar yen. That's the way it's been absolutely crushed. And uh, by the way, on that, I, I, what I'm, on the news, I'm looking at the, uh, the U.S. 30 uh, has jumped about 30 points or 30 to 40 points in the uh, on this news as well. It's back up about at uh, 17,800 on the Dow. So we are uh, we are definitely seeing this uh, U.S. markets both on the stock side and on the currency side uh, taking this as a uh, a less hawkish Fed. And the average hourly earnings rate on the on the annualized rate has been down. It's gone down from 2.3 to 2 percent. Let's bring the Bloomberg, and we can actually look at this. But also, the the May number has been revised downwards as well to 0.2. So we've had a downward revision of May from 280 to 254. We've downward really revised average hourly earnings, and the participation rate is its lowest level. Um, since 1977. So basically, all across the board, it's pretty poor. 
it's not great. It's not a dollar positive story. Um, it could be a, certainly a dollar. It's a stock positive story because it keeps the Fed on the sidelines, I think, that much longer. But what it, what it doesn't, you know, it, it basically helps underpin stock markets. But certainly I think the stock market is struggling to make sense of it. Let's look at this chart here. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've ratcheted higher a little bit, and now we're settling back down. I think once U.S. markets open in around about just under an hour, we could well see the S&P start to edge higher. But certainly in the context of, um, I think, I think the, t the key takeaway here is um, a weaker dollar, slightly firmer, um, slightly firmer currencies across the board, which sort of does feed into that narrative that we were talking about beforehand, I think. Yeah, Did you think that s and to a dollar, dollar chart, Michael? Sorry, you want me to change? Yeah, can you take that to a daily chart on the S&P? Sure, one second. Just one thing I wanted to highlight with this uh, with this bounce is you've got this uh, a channel here with a uh, a low in and around 2060, and you're uh, you're still bouncing up uh, off of that. So you're uh, you're still looking at this overall sideways trend is is still intact, and you are holding the holding the bottom of it again here. And with this rally, you could see it back up in time. Up Are you into, talking about this low here in March, Colin? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, that's actually the 2040 low, and there's okay. and then you look at how it's bounced off this average here near 2060, and this uh, beginning of May uh, mm -hmm. low here if you drew a, a line across that. So uh, overall, you're still in this sideways channel, and you're you're starting to work your way up within it. It'll be interesting to see what it does at that little gap there at uh, which was what, just above 2090. Uh, that's a uh, an area where you could see first resistance if that doesn't contain the rally. This could swing up a little more. Right there. Yeah. Well, I'll just put that little circle right there, that. That, that little gap there. Yeah, I mean, as a general rule, yeah. so gaps tend. That, to be test the high. Yeah. As a general rule, gaps tend to get filled, and there is a definite gap um, between this peak here around about 2092 and the lows that we saw um, certainly on the Friday. So the Friday lows were, t were 2095, and we've got. 2091. So basically, between 2091 and 2095, there's a gap there, and you would expect that at some point to get tested and filled in over the course of maybe the next day or so. One thing, one another thing is that's also I think important to remember, ladies and gentlemen, is that the U.S. is not in tomorrow, which means yes, that you. the likelihood of any stock traders taking on significantly um, big new positions ahead of a long weekend and a Greek referendum um, are likely to be fairly constrained. So I think it's unlikely that we're going to we're going to we're going to go above um, that gap. But at the same time, I don't think we're going to come crashing off either. This is going to be very much a dollar an FX move today. I don't think it's going to be a a an indices move. If we can look at gold. Well, we can probably see that that's probably bounced up now off the back or it's off the lows. I could be wrong on that. It has come a bit higher. This is a one-hour chart. So as we can see, it's off the lows of the day around about 11.57. But it's certainly not ripping up any trees, certainly in the context of where we were, say, at the beginning of today, um, 2nd of July. We were still, we were st you know, we're still well down on the day. So... For me, that, yeah. that suggests there's a significant amount of weakness in the gold price, which I'm struggling to I square. I find it bizarre, too, Michael, that the that gold is down as much as it is heading into a referendum with the, the level of political risk. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that doesn't that make that weakening U.S. dollar and everything else. I mean, you think gold would be staking here, but it's not. But I also think that the, the level of risk with respect to Greece is slightly overstated, which may, may seem a little bit strange, may seem a strange thing to say, but there is no mechanism, irrespective of how Greece votes tomorrow, not tomorrow, on Sunday, to eject a member from the EU. So the, I think the only thing that Greece can do um, is default within the euro area there's so much there's so much politics involved in this Greece story that I, I think it's unlikely that um, 
the EU will be allowed to cut them loose even if they wanted to because you can imagine the US's view and a potential pivot to Russia or China. They don't want a failed state on the edge of the Balkans, not with what's going on in Africa at the moment and the migrant crisis. That would just be a license to, you know, lose, um, yeah, yeah. license to further unrest. Are you, I can barely yeah. hear you, mate. Oh, sorry. Colin? Is that better? Oh, Michael, yeah. is this better? Yeah, oh, it is great. better. Sorry, I lost you. So you were saying? Yeah, I agree with you completely. There's the potential here that, like I said, that I don't think they want any of that to happen. If, uh, you know, if, if Greece further destabilizes, that's a uh, that's a huge problem because it's still a country that uh, that's incredibly strategically located and, and, and very important beyond okay. its size and, and beyond its uh, and beyond its uh, crisis. And on top of that, you have to think about the the. Uh, humanitarian crisis that's been going on for quite some time and uh, and the implications of if they let this spiral out of control for uh, for other countries as well. Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, as I say, I, I don't think it's, I don't think the disaster scenario is the practical one. I don't think it will be allowed to spiral out of control. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gents, this is just about, this is about you just as it is about us. So if there's anything that you want us to cover in terms of currency pairs, asset prices or what have you, Speak up now, send us a message via the chat and we'll cover it. I'm going to move on to the Australian dollar now because there's certainly been an awful lot of speculation that the Australian dollar um, could actually start to, to track higher or sorry, track lower because of expectations of RBA, RB, further RBA rate cuts. At the moment, big, big support around about 75.90 on the daily charts. We can see that through the June lows. We had a little bit of a spike low at the end of June, but there does appear to be a significant amount of support around about 75.90 um, at these current levels. So, again, I think it's really a case of we're in a downward channel, or we're in a, certainly in a downward, downward trend. If we break below 75.90, there's certainly potential, if I can actually get my chart to work, um, to actually track lower. Here we go. There we go. So let's go to the four-hour chart. There we go. There's a, lot of there's a lot of feedback on your line, Colin. Can you just filter that out for me? Sure. Um, sure, I'll see what that can do here. So 75.90 is the key support there. And then below that, you've got the April lows. So I think if we get a move through 75.90, it does appear to be the way that we're tracking at the moment. Um, then we could well see further weakness towards 75.30. It's one of those moves that's probably going to act, it's going to act out in slow motion. It's also probably been dragged down a little bit by a bit of Aussie Kiwi. But, but overall, the direction of travel seems pretty clear here. Every time it rallies off this key support 75.90, every subsequent rebound, it's the, 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 highs, the, highs, the, high, the highs are getting lower. The highs are getting lower. So... So that's a big um, descending triangle there. Maybe we could show the Kiwi dollar next and see what they, what's yeah. leading it lower. Let's have a look at the Kiwi dollar. That's right here. This is well, I think there's no disputing, where, no disputing where the trend is on good. that one. Yeah. So let's, let's do the daily here. Okay. Draw a line right through there. That is a beautiful thing. That is a mm -hmm. thing of beauty. If you're a chartist, that is a thing of beauty. And that's a so, nice 45 degree angle, downward sloping, just straight distribution uh, trend that, line there. So the interesting thing with this one like is, is that everybody... like a downward escalator, that is. It's like a downward escalator. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Colin. Just Sorry. amazing. I was going to say, so we've got weak inflation and, and milk prices and things in, in New Zealand, but one of the things also that gives them a lot of scope to cut is that they actually had gone ahead last year and raised interest rates by 1% when everybody else was kind of going the other way. And, and so they've certainly got a lot of room, a lot of room for more cuts, which is why they're, uh, they're underperforming the, uh, the Aussie dollar right now. But it will be interesting to see how does this, uh, what does that mean for, uh, for other countries as well, because they, they at least are one that's benefiting from having raised interest rates. Uh, and then now giving them the room with, but the, uh, so the Fed at some point needs to, but, uh, but uh, at this point, it looks it's looking pretty shaky for them for September between all the uh, all the crises and the employment. That's and very counterintuitive. Right? If, uh, 
Yeah, I know. The funny thing is with the states, is though, the question is now, what happens if uh, if they start going off the rails? They've had, you know, do you bring in QE4 or do you do something else? Hmm. QE4. They kind of painted themselves in the corner. Well, what do they, I guess the question is, what do they do if the U.S. goes gets in trouble again? Well, yeah, there is that. There is that. I mean, people have made a great play of the dot charts, the Fed dot charts, and the fact that there's potential for two rate two rate rises this year. Based on what we've just seen right now, um, I think they're going to struggle unlikely. to do one. I think they're going to struggle to do one. Um, okay. I, I've just like been asked to do, Yeah. I've just, just been asked to do Sterling Aussie, um, so I will do that. Let's have a quick look at that. This is not one I prepared earlier. Right, well, that's an interesting chart, actually. That looks as if it's sort of starting to top out a little bit. You've got a good area of support right through there, 202.60, 202.55. You look at that double top and the stochastics, and it's rolling down. Yeah, but also if you look at these peaks, I mean, to be quite honest, it, this does this, this does look a little bit toppy. Um, but having said that, I mean, it did this over here in February, March. It traded sideways for a bit, and then suddenly, it, then, it, and then after about two or three months, it um, it trades higher. And I think certainly in the context of this here, we do have negative divergence. But um, for me, these long shadows on the daily candles suggest that there's plenty of interest to buy sterling any, on any dips. And um, as such, I think. Certainly, the direction of travel does appear to be to continue to go higher while we stay above 202.50. Certainly, if we draw a trend line through these lows here, that pretty much coincides with that there. So, at the moment, I probably would sit on my hands. But if we get a dip back to this area through here, then I would certainly looking looking to be buying sterling Aussie with a stop loss below 202. Um, Right, guys, if you need to ask any questions, Simon, for example, if you use the chat facility. Um, so if I just do a quick message, I'm just going to chat here, and then you just reply to that message that I've just sent to all attendees. Right, okay. Perfect. Dolly N, August 15th, October 14th, and May 15th lows, close to turning on months away still. Mm, that's a good question. Um, for me, I think, I think the weaker side of the dollar story, the dollar yen story, is at 121.80. It's these series of lows through here. Um, I think you know, everyone thinks dollar yen is going to go higher. I'm not sure that the yen can continue to remain as weak as it has been, um, simply because I think Japanese small businesses are already up in arms about the fact that I mean, it's hurting their business in terms of their import costs. So. Direction of travel for here for me suggests that the weak side is the downside, but we need to take out this 12180 level here. That's what's that's what's really I think for me holding 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 it up. So if we extend this all the way back, which I'm going to do right now. So let me see. All right, Dolly in August, uh, May 5th. You're asking me to draw a trend line through the August, August and October lows, Simon, right? So it's these two here. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, I mean, that's still quite some way away. We need to get through 120, we need to get through 121.85 first. Um, Simon, so at the moment we're, I think we're still some way away from that. As long as we stay below this downtrend line here, then I think there's a good chance we can come back. Retest 121.80. I've heard there are a lot of stops, losses below 121.80. If we kick out 121.80, then we could go for a trip to the downside and that trend line that you, t you, you talked about. Um, right, what else am I being asked here? There isn't a participation rate in CMC markets at the moment. It's one of those numbers, unfortunately, that um, has only started to become relatively important relative to the unemployment rate in, say, for the past 
you know, sort of six to seven months simply because it's continued to fall in the same way that there is, some, there's an, there is a participation rate for UK employment. UK employment is at record highs. It's around about 73%. Um, but again, we don't have a number for that, and neither does Bloomberg. It's just that US, the Bloomberg does have a number for the US participation rate. The FTSE, um, the FTSE 100. Let me quickly go to that because we haven't covered that, but I think it's fairly relevant. At the moment, there's a significant resistance level and a gap around about 6660 at the moment. So we've got resistance here. Why? Because it's basically the series of lows through here. So that's going to be a bit of a resistance on the way back up. And then above that, we've got the 200-day moving average. So um, this does look, by and large, fairly positive. So I think we could get a push higher in the FTSE 100. But to, to, under, you know, to unwind the downward pressure, we really need to see this gap filled and for the market to close back above the 200-day moving average. Okay. So that pretty much wraps up this week's webinar, or this month's webinar, rather. Thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. We will be posting this on YouTube sometime in the next 24 hours. Um, hopefully you um, enjoyed the contents of this webinar. And Colin and I would once again like to thank you guys for your feedback, your questions. Until next month, um, you know, stay out of trouble and uh, good trading. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today. It still looks like we have an active day of trading. And, uh, and certainly next week will likely also be a busy one. Uh, later this month, Michael and I will also be having our analyst debates webinar. So we look forward to seeing you then. Cheers, Colin. Cheers, Michael. Thanks. Thanks.